Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Triple N Media. I am Dr. Nick Nickham and I am a cardiologist. I have been in practice for more than 30 years at the Texas Medical Center and today we are going to learn something about the ACLS drugs and how to use them. So let's begin. Before we get into individual drugs, let us look at what are the things that go wrong during an acute cardiovascular emergency and how we can address those based on the appropriate actions of a given group of drugs. The main purpose of the heart is to maintain adequate cardiac output and also supplying oxygen to the brain, lungs, kidneys, heart and the rest of the body. That is dependent on left ventricular contractility, preload and afterload which determines the stroke volume. The stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate will give us the cardiac output. So during a cardiac arrest, say for example in a patient with an acute myocardial infarction, uh, due to an extensive damage to the myocardium, the pumping effect of the heart may be compromised. Along with the reduced left ventricular pumping action, the patient may also have serious cardiac arrhythmia such as ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, bradycardia or even asystole. So this series of events can lead to cardiovascular collapse and unless we take appropriate actions immediately, that patient can suffer permanent brain damage that can be detrimental to the outcome of a successful cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We have a whole group of drugs that we are going to be talking about that can maintain the left ventricular, that can improve the left ventricular contractility, improve the stroke volume and also maintain vascular resistance, the preload and the afterload, such as epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, dobutamine, vasopressin. And on the other hand, uh, you can have adequate stroke volume, but if your heart rhythm is not uh, normal, then you can end up with a reduced cardiac output, low perfusion and end organ damage. In order to address these uh, cardiac arrhythmias such as uh, supraventricular tachycardia like atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response, so atrial flutter or ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation or even bradycardia or asystole, we are going to have a whole bunch of drugs that are going to help us to restore the normal sinus rhythm if at all possible. One more aspect we need to take into consideration is the blood. We could improve the contractility, but unless we have adequate perfusion pressure, then the purpose of uh, ACLS may be less efficient. Hence, it is very important for us to establish adequate blood pressure that will enable us to perfuse the vital organs during a cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So, on one hand, we have drugs that can improve the, the resistance by either causing vasoconstriction and at times improving vasodilatation in certain organs that will help to improve the overall cardiac performance. And on this side, as far as the rate and rhythm are concerned, uh, we have all these drugs we just talked about. So let's look at some of the general things we need to know about using drugs and other procedures during a acute cardiopulmonary resuscitation. In a setting of a cardiac arrest, it is essential to have a large bore peripheral IV or preferably a central line if time permits. Because you want to get all the drugs to reach the target organs, namely the heart in most cases, and also the vascular system where you want to improve the systemic vascular resistance, where you want to improve the blood pressure. And also we must be able to give these medicines promptly and appropriately. Most of the IV medicines, as I said, they need to reach the heart and the vascular system, hence it is uh, prudent to flush the IV line with at least 20 cc's of saline so that the medicine circulates uh, through the entire body. 
if we don't have an IV access, occasionally we can use endotracheal access and in very rare conditions we can use intracardiac, but we can address that later on. Okay, let's look at the first group of drugs that deal with the contractility, preload and afterload. Contractility is basically the pumping function of the heart, which may be compromised in the presence of uh, massive myocardial infarction, severe congestive heart failure, or pulmonary embolus. The preload. Preload refers to the venous return. Preload can be compromised in patients with uh, severe bleeding, shock, vagal effect. The afterload. Afterload can be related to increased systemic vascular resistance which may be found in patients with severe congestive heart failure and uh, all these things need to be taken into consideration. So the drugs that directly affect these uh, three elements, the contractility, preload and afterload are the drugs that fall into the adrenergic group or epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine and occasionally dobutamine but we do not use that very commonly in a patient with acute uh, cardiopulmonary arrest. It's more useful in patients with low cardiac output, in patients with congestive heart failure and of course vasopressin. Vasopressin doesn't really have any direct effect on the heart but it has been found to be useful in acute cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The adrenergic drugs act on the alpha and beta receptors located in the vascular smooth muscles and also in the heart. Most of the beta receptors are located in the heart, especially beta 1 and beta 2 in the lungs. Whereas alpha receptors, alpha 1 and alpha 2, they are located in the vascular smooth muscles and other organs and they can affect the the heart rate and also contractility. Basically, alpha-1 has a predominant vasoconstrictive effect. Alpha-2 does vasodilatation, whereas uh, beta-1 receptors, which are basically located in the heart muscle, they have a positive inotropic and chronotropic uh, effect. Beta-2, predominantly in the bronchial Three dilates the airways. Okay, let's start with epinephrine. Epinephrine is the most commonly used drug during a cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It is the drug which is used first. This epinephrine has both alpha and beta agonistic uh, properties. So it, it increases heart rate, it increases uh, left ventricular contractility, it also by causing vasoconstriction increases the systemic vascular resistance and of course blood pressure. Because of all these positive effects on the cardiovascular system, of course it is going to increase the myocardial oxygen requirement which is one of the unwanted side effect. Again, epinephrine, since it is acting on the myocardium, it can also increase atomicity and also improve coronary and cerebral blood flow. Epinephrine comes in a pre-arranged syringe in one to 10,000 dilution, uh, one milligram, which can be given intravenously. Dose, one milligram every three to five minutes. This can be repeated every three to five minutes. Epinephrine can also be given as a continuous infusion at a rate of 0.1 to 0.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. We can use up to a maximum of 0.2 milligrams per kg to counteract the effects of beta blocker or calcium channel blocker excess. Again, as I told you, all these medicines need to be flushed with the 20 cc's of saline to make sure that the medicine reaches the heart and the cardiovascular system. Some of the main side effects of epinephrine are increased myocardial ischemia and also increased myocardial irritability. So 
In essence, epinephrine is one of the most commonly used drugs uh, during cardiac resuscitation. You start off with uh, one milligram of epinephrine and the second dose can be of course replaced with vasopressin which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Otherwise, you can repeat this epinephrine every three to five minutes throughout the entire course of a cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The next drug in this category, which is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine has a predominantly uh, alpha-1 effect, more so than the beta stimulation effect. As a result, norepinephrine produces more significant vasoconstriction and also maintain blood pressure. So norepinephrine has activities on both alpha and beta receptors. It also increases uh, the left ventricular contractility and the heart rate. It increases systemic vascular resistance and increases uh, blood pressure. And it has uh, uh, activities very similar to epinephrine except for its uh, dominant uh, peripheral vasoconstrictive effect due to alpha-1 stimulation. Norepinephrine is given basically as an intravenous infusion uh, at a rate of 0.1 to 0.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Uh, the side effects are similar to that of uh, epinephrine except uh, if the norepinephrine infiltrates in to the tissue at the IV site it can cause discoloration or in rare cases uh, tissue necrosis. So it is very important uh, to make sure that norepinephrine is administered through a large bore peripheral IV or preferably through a central line. The norepinephrine should be titrated by monitoring continuous blood pressure. If you don't have an arterial line, you can monitor the blood pressure every five minutes and then titrate the dose uh, to just maintain optimal blood pressure in the range of uh, 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Let's look at dopamine. Dopamine is a precursor of norepinephrine that stimulates dopaminergic alpha and beta receptors and this is dose dependent. At a 1 to 5 micrograms per kg per minute, it uh, improves cerebral, renal and mesenteric perfusion. Between 5 and 10 micrograms per kg per minute, it uh, stimulates alpha 1 and beta receptors resulting in cardiac increased cardiac output, heart rate, blood pressure and contractility of the left ventricle. However, when you increase the dose to a range of 10 to 20 micrograms per kg per minute, then it increases the blood pressure by predominantly stimulating the alpha receptors in the peripheral vascular system. So you may want to start off with 1 to 2 micrograms per kilogram per minute, then gradually increase the dosage based on the blood pressure and tissue perfusion. Of course, dopamine is indicated in situations where there is a severe systemic bradycardia, which is not responding to atropine, associated with hemodynamically significant hypotension in the absence of uh, hypovolemia. If the hypotension is related to severe bleeding, then replacing it with colloids or transfusion may be more appropriate before we institute dopamine as an additional supportive measure. Uh, if there is a very severe symptomatic bradycardia that does not respond to the drug, then of course uh, uh, pacing may be an option. The side effects of most of these adrenergic drugs are very similar because they increase the heart rate, they induce cardiac arrhythmias and uh, Occasionally, we can see tissue sloughing. If the medicine seeps into the subcutaneous tissue at the IV site. One important caution is that you do not mix dopamine with sodium bicarbonate as the medication 
may get precipitated. As a result, the patient may not be getting what you think uh, the patient should be getting. Vasopressin is, is a potent vasoconstrictor. Yeah, it improves the perfusion of the heart, lungs and brain and it has no direct effect on the heart muscle itself. So it doesn't affect the contractility but it does help to improve the peripheral resistance and thus improve the blood pressure. It may result in an initial increase in blood pressure which may be followed by a return of the, the pulse rate to a normal level. And again, this can also provoke cardiac ischemia by increasing the afterload significantly. It is given once as a 40 units IV bolus and this can be used to substitute the second or even the first dose of epinephrine. Vasopressin is not repeated again during the course of uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If you don't have a, a direct IV access, this can be given through the endotracheal tube. The medicine needs to be diluted in a 10 ml of normal saline before it is injected. Okay, now let us look at the drugs which affect the heart rate and the heart rhythm, such as supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, or severe bradycardia, or even asystole. The drugs in this category are adenosine, atropine, lidocaine, amiodarone, procainamide, magnesium, isoprel, and beta blockers. All of these drugs are used to restore normal sinus rhythm, if possible, or at the least control the ventricular rate and maintain adequate heart rate to improve the cardiac output. If you look at it from individual condition, such as tachycardia, bradycardia, asystole, or ventricular fibrillation, then we can further subdivide these drugs into these uh, categories. The drugs that are useful in patients with uh, tachycardia are adenosine, diltazem, beta blockers, amiodarone, digoxin, and verapamil. Of course, uh, the, the digoxin and verapamil are not routinely used in acute situations, but verapamil can be given in an acute situation to slow the heart rate, but it's given more often as a oral medication for control of atrial fibrillation with the rapid ventricular response in patients with severe uh, lung disease who cannot tolerate beta blockers. Anyway, as far as bradycardia is concerned, we have atropine, epinephrine, and dopamine, and if all these things don't work, transcutaneous pacemaker or a transvenous pacemaker may be in order. When we are dealing with asystole, where there is no ventricular activity, or if there is ventricular activity with absolutely no discernible blood pressure, which is called a pulseless electrical activity, then we have choices of epinephrine, vasopressin, and atropine. So when we get to the other extreme of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, the drugs that are most useful are of course, the first line of drug would be amiodarone, and then epinephrine, vasopressin, procainamide, lidocaine, and occasionally magnesium. So let's look at uh, some of these drugs in detail. Amiodarone. Amiodarone is the most commonly used antiarrhythmic drug. It affects the sodium and potassium pumps. It may produce vasodilatation, it can also have a negative inotropic effect on the heart that is reducing the contractility of the left ventricle. Amiodarone has a half-life of 40 days. It is used as the first-line antiarrhythmic drug during a cardiopulmonary resuscitation, especially when you have ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, or even wide QRS tachycardia where you don't know what the origin is. It is also good for supraventricular tachycardia, such as uh, 
atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. During a cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the dose of amiodarone is uh, 300 mg IV push diluted in uh, 20 to 30 ml of D5 and water. This can be followed by 150 mg uh, in 20 to 30 ml of D5 and water in 3 to 5 minutes uh, if needed. The maximum dose of uh, amiodarone should not be more than 2.2 grams per 24 hours. And amiodarone can also be given as uh, a, a continuous intravenous infusion at a rate of 1 milligram per minute for 6 hours. Then reduce the dose to 0 0.5 milligram for 18 hours. And finally, a maintenance dose of 0 0.5 milligrams per minute. As I already mentioned, amiodarone has a half-life of 40 days, so it lasts in the body for a long time. Some other side effects of amiodarone include reduction in blood pressure, reduction in heart rate, and it can also prolong P or QRS in QT intervals. Again, it's best to administer uh, using a large bore uh, intravenous uh, line. The next drug that is most useful in the presence of uh, serious ventricular arrhythmia such as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation is procainamide. Procainamide has been around for a long time and uh, was a uh, favored drug at one time. It uh, lost its lust but it has come back come back as a second line of drug for treatment of ventricular arrhythmias during cardiac arrest. Procainamide reduces recurrent ventricular fibrillation. It also depresses automaticity. Uh, it depresses ventricular muscle excitability. It raises the ventricular fibrillation threshold, which is an important uh, effect that will help to minimize the rhythm from going back to fibrillation. It also suppresses uh, ectopic activity. But it should be used with caution in patients with uh, left ventricular rejection fraction of less than 40%. So the most common indications for procainamide are of course ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. It also works uh, equally well in patients with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, especially those patients who have WPW and you're not sure what is the origin of the wide QRS complex tachycardia, then it would be safe to use procainamide. It is uh, useful in persistent uh, VT or ventricular fibrillation and of course the stable ventricular tachycardia. The dose of procainamide is 30 milligrams per minute up to 50 milligrams per minute. In urgent situations, uh, to a maximum of 17 milligrams per kg. You can also maintain an, uh, an intravenous infusion at a rate of 1 to 4 milligrams per minute. If significant arrhythmias develop, uh, you can reduce the dose or, or stop the infusion. Some of the side effects of uh, procainamide include a drop in blood pressure and QRS widening by as much as 50% from the baseline. The next line of drug is, of course, lidocaine. Lidocaine has been around uh, uh, for many, many decades. Uh, it has sort of uh, taken the back seat uh, more recently, I should say. Nonetheless, lidocaine is pretty useful in patients uh, during cardiac arrest. Um, lidocaine uh, reduces automaticity. It reduces uh, ventricular ectopic activity. It also increases uh, ventricular fibrillation threshold just like uh, procainamide. And this is dependent on the plasma concentration of lidocaine. Uh, between 2 and 5 micrograms uh, per ml, uh, lidocaine helps to control ventricular ectopic activity. At uh, 0 0.6 micrograms per ml, uh, it acts like uh, anti-fibrillatory drug. Lidocaine is used for uh, persistent or refractory ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and wide complex tachycardia. 
with the exception of WPW where it can make the condition worse by accelerating the conduction through the accessory pathway. Lidocaine, as I said, is given uh, as, as an initial 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg dose, which is approximately 75 to 100 milligrams based on the weight. And this can be repeated uh, by giving half the dose every 5 to 10 minutes to a maximum of 3 milligrams per kg. Uh, which comes to 200 milligrams in a patient who is approximately 70 kg. If you are having a stable ventricular tachycardia, this can be treated with 0.5 to 0.75 milligram per kg or up to 1.5 milligram per kg. And you can also maintain an intravenous infusion drip at a rate of 1 to 4 milligram per minute. Lidocaine dosage has to be adjusted in the presence of uh, low cardiac output in patients with congestive heart failure with cardiogenic shock or low ejection fraction, patients with hepatic dysfunction or elderly patients over 70 years of age. It's uh, useful to reduce the dose by 50%. The rare side effects of lidocaine include muscle twitching and, and rarely focal or grand mal seizures. All right, let's move on to magnesium. Magnesium is useful in patients who have low magnesium level. It is a physiological calcium channel blocker and it has been found particularly useful in patients with uh, torsoid. So the dose of magnesium in patients with uh, torsoid ventricular Fibrillation is 1 to 2 grams mixed in 10 ml of D5 and water given over 5 to 20 minutes. Again, in, in patients with torsoid, with uh, acute myocardial infarction, or those who have low magnesium level, we can give 1 to 2 grams in 50 to 100 ml over 5 to 60 minutes if uh, the condition permits. The main side effects of magnesium include flushing, sweating, and a mild decrease in heart rate and blood pressure. The next drug is, of course, atropine. All of us are familiar with the atropine. One of the situations we most commonly use atropine is in the presence uh, is for treatment of uh, symptomatic bradycardia. It's very important to underline the word symptomatic bradycardia. Basically, atropine is a uh, anticholinergic drug. It is a parasympathomimetic uh, blocking drug. It blocks the action of acetylcholine on the parasympathetic receptors. It is like a vagolytic drug uh, which increases the heart rate and can also increase cardiac output. Atropine is indicated in patients with symptomatic bradycardia. Those who have a heart rate of 40 who are up and around walking which happens to be many of my cardiac patients, we don't need to treat them with atropine. But if the patient is in a hospital whose blood pressure is 80 with a heart rate of 40, then it is reasonable to give atropine to improve the heart rate and also to improve the blood pressure. So if you have a patient with pulse rate of less than 60 per minute with inadequate perfusion, then atropine would be indicated. Please note that the atropine is not useful in patients with uh, it's not useful in second degree or higher degrees of AV block. The dose of atropine is 0.5 milligrams every 3 to 5 minutes for patients with symptomatic bradycardia up to a maximum of uh, 3 milligrams. The usual recommended vagolytic dose is 2 to 3 milligrams. The side effects of atropine could include uncontrolled heart rate, which can increase myocardial ischemia, and you can also see some flushing. Occasionally, you can see ataxia or blurred vision. The reason I put this flushing, ataxia, blurred vision is because in a multiple choice question, uh, they may put one of these items just to kind of deceive you. So, you may want to remember these words, flushing, ataxia, blurred vision, in connection with atropine. Okay, 
you're all familiar with adenosine especially if you work uh, uh, in the emergency room setup basically adenosine chemically blocks the ab nodal re-entry the most common use for adenosine is in a patient with a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and occasionally in patients with atrial flutter unless the patient has an arrhythmia due to AV nodal or SA nodal re-entry, namely atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, adenosine will not terminate arrhythmias. In other words, adenosine may be useless in patients with uh, ventricular tachycardia that is due to increased irritability. The dosage of adenosine is uh, pretty simple and straightforward. You give 6 milligrams bolus in uh, a quick uh, rapid uh, injection uh, if that doesn't work after uh, one to two minutes uh, you repeat double the dose that is 12 milligrams IV push and this should be followed by 20 milligrams of saline flush to make sure that the drug gets into the central circulation especially reach the heart and the conduction system however if you are injecting this through a central line make sure you cut the dose by half that is give only three milligrams otherwise you can flood the conduction system and that could lead to significant bradycardia or a longer period of asystole if the patient is receiving dipyridamol which blocks adenosine uptake and potentiates its effect you may want to reduce the dosage to 3 milligrams. On the other hand, patients are taking theophylline or caffeine are less sensitive and may require greater doses. Heart transplant patients are more sensitive to adenosine and may require smaller doses. Anyway, side effects, flushing, chest pain, brief asystole uh, and or bradycardia. The adenosine effect may be short-lived uh, and hence we have to take measures to treat the underlying rhythm problem which will be to use drugs, longer acting drugs that can uh, prevent the patient from going into paroxysmal tachycardia. Uh, in which case you may be using digoxin or beta blockers or amiodarone to, for long-term control of uh, uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Let's talk about beta blockers. Beta blockers are used to reduce myocardial ischemia or damage in the presence of an acute myocardial infarction in patients with elevated heart rate, blood pressure or both. The beta blockers block the catecholamine uh, receptors uh, by binding to the beta adrenergic uh, receptors. They reduce the heart rate, blood pressure and myocardial contractility. They also decrease the AV nodal conduction. As a result, it reduces the heart rate. It decreases the incidence of primary ventricular fibrillation, especially in patients with a known history of coronary artery disease. The most commonly used beta blockers are uh, esmolol, which is uh, very uncommon in a cardiac arrest setup, but in an operating room, uh, it's, it's used by cardiac surgeons. Esmolol is given as a 0.5 milligram per kg over one minute, followed by a continuous infusion at 0.05 milligrams per kg per minute. This is a tritatrid. Uh, according to the blood pressure. Well, the reason the surgeons use esmolol in operating rooms is because of its very short half-life, which is less than 10 minutes. Labetalol is given as a 10 milligram uh, IV push over one to two minutes. And this can be repeated every 10 minutes up to a maximum of 150 milligrams. And it is usually used uh, in patients with uh, rapid heart rate uh, where we want to bring the heart rate down. Uh, similarly, we have metaprolol, which is very commonly used in patients with atrial fibrillation with the rapid ventricular response, where we give 5 milligrams intravenously, uh, slowly, and 
every five at at every five minute interval we can repeat the dose up to a maximum of 15 milligrams <coughs> atenolol is not very commonly given intravenously but it does work it may take a little longer time and of course uh, propranolol is, is not used very commonly in the presence of a cardiopulmonary resuscitation we need to understand some of the absolute contraindications for beta blocker use uh, in cardiovascular patients. Those patients with a severely decompensated left ventricular function, like patients with congestive heart failure with significantly reduced ejection fractions, uh, less than 30%. Also, patients who have blood pressure that is less than 100 millimeters of mercury, or patients who have a history of uh, bronchospasm or acute asthma, which may be exacerbated by these beta blockers. And of course, you want to avoid this in patients with the second and third degree AV block as the, con as the, condi as the conduction can get worse by giving beta blockers. Some of the precautions we need to take are mild to moderate patients congestive heart failure patients may be able to tolerate this, but this has to be weighed against the benefits. Heart rate less than 50 beats per minute uh, should alert us to monitor the heart rate more cautiously because uh, the beta blockers reduce the heart rate. Again, in patients with history of asthma, diabetes, and severe peripheral vascular disease, uh, we need to see what would be the most appropriate drug while considering beta blockers. Now let's move on to diltiazem. Diltiazem is a different class of drug which acts as a calcium channel blocker. The other drug in this category is verapamil, which are used uh, for control of basically the rate. Deltazem has been found to be useful in managing left, uh, left ventricular rate in patients with atrial fibrillation, flutter, or even supraventricular tachycardia, or even multifocal atrial tachycardia. However, it is contraindicated in patients with the six sinus syndrome, or also in patients with the second and third degree AV blocks. The usual dose of deltazem is 0.5 milligrams per kg over two minutes, or basically one fourth the weight of the patient. If the patient weighs 80 kilograms, then you're talking about 20 milligrams IV. And it can also be given as a continuous intravenous drip at five to 15 milligrams per hour. Okay, let's look at some of the medications that we use to change the metabolic status. During cardiopulmonary resuscitation, there may be several underlying causes that could have caused a cardiovascular collapse, like severe metabolic acidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, or renal acidosis, or patients with severe hypotension. So here are some of the drugs that may help to manage the problems. First, in that group is the sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate is frequently used during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It is one of the ACLS drugs, but we have to understand that uh, sodium carbonate is useful in metabolic acidosis resulting from diabetes or kidney problem or drug overdose or aspirin overdose. But sodium bicarbonate is not very useful in patients with hypoperfusion and lactic acidosis, which is the main thing that we face during a cardiac arrest. So the bi sodium bicarbonate basically takes a free hydrogen ion and then converts it into uh, water and carbon dioxide. So the best treatment for lactic acidosis, which is the result of poor perfusion, is to provide adequate uh, ventilation and CPR and minimize the use of bicarbonate because the bicarbonate is not very useful in treating lactic acidosis due to poor perfusion. The dose of bicarbonate is one milli equivalent per kg then half the dose every 10 minutes thereafter. Of course, the side effects of sodium bicarbonate are, as its name indicates, sodium overload, 
and also increase alkalosis if you give excess of uh, this bicarbonate. It also increases uh, plasma osmolality because of uh, extra load of uh, sodium into the cardiovascular system and sometimes it can worsen the intracellular acid levels. Contraindications, as I said, hypoxic lactic acidosis is very poorly responds to bicarbonate injection, even though the numbers may look good temporarily, but it doesn't correct. The best way to correct lactic acidosis is to perform the best cardiopulmonary resuscitation based on the latest guidelines. 100 compressions, two breaths so that we maintain good perfusion and maintain good oxygenation so that it reduces the lactic acid uh, by itself. Let's look at calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is mostly useful in patients with the suspected hyperkalemia uh, or in patients with renal failure. It's also useful in patients who have low calcium levels. It can be used as an antidote for toxic effects of calcium channel blockers, overdose, and it can prevent hypotension caused by excess calcium channel blockers. Calcium chloride is given as an IV push, 8 to 16 milligrams per kg, usually 5 to 10 ml IV for hyperkalemia or calcium channel blocker overdose. 2 to 4 milligrams per kg Usually 2 ml IV push is uh, given as a, prophylactic, as a prophylactic treatment before IV calcium channel blockers. Calcium chloride has uh, sort of lost its place in routine cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And one more important thing, you don't want to mix calcium chloride uh, with sodium bicarbonate as uh, calcium will be precipitated if we mix them together. Now let's look at some supportive measures that are available in dealing with uh, patients with cardiovascular collapse who need advanced cardiac life support. Aspirin. Aspirin is an important drug that is indicated for patients with acute coronary syndromes, acute myocardial infarction, or patients walking into the emergency room with uh, unknown chest pain. Aspirin blocks the formation of a thromboxane A2, which causes a permanent platelet dysfunction. It prevents platelet aggregation and thus prevent uh, clot formation. Aspirin is indicated in all patients with acute coronary syndrome unless there is a previous history of active GI bleeding related to aspirin. It is, should be given as soon as the patient arrives in the emergency room. Uh, the dose should be between 160 to 325 milligrams uh, by mouth or preferably in a chewable form. It is relatively contraindicated in patients with active ulcer or a history of asthma. Let's talk about oxygen. Oxygen is very vital. It is as vital as chest compressions because the main purpose of cardiopulmonary resuscitation is to get adequate blood circulation, good amount of oxygen available to perfuse brain, lungs, heart, and kidney. So when you are using a nasal uh, prongs, if the oxygen flow is between one and six uh, liters per minute, we can get uh, uh, oxygen up to 24 to 44%. If we use a venturi mask, we can go up to the same level. But by using a partial rebreather mask, that can be jacked up to 60%. The only way to get 100% oxygen is to use a bag mask with 15 liters per minute of oxygen that can bring the oxygen intake to almost 100%. Pulse oximetry is not a very good parameter for measuring how good the oxygen level is. A lot of times uh, patients may have things on their fingernails which may not register the pulse oximetry readings appropriately. Again in patients with poor perfusion, peripheral arterial disease or patients with significant low cardiac output 
or hypothermia the pulse oximeter may not be very reliable in terms of determining how good the oxygen level is in the blood itself the best way to check that would be to get an arterial blood gas uh, if uh, that is feasible that will tell us how well the patient has been uh, ventilated and how well the blood is being oxygenated uh, from the cardiopulmonary resuscitation the next drug we have is nitroglycerin which is very familiar to most of you nitroglycerin is most common most commonly used in patients with the angina pectoris for temporary relief of uh, chest pain nitroglycerin can also be administered intravenously in patients uh, in the intensive care unit to set up for management of chest pain with acute myocardial infarction so the nitroglycerin is an important medicine that we should be familiar with the nitroglycerin basically it reduces the preload it, it that is it it causes venodilatation which leads to reduced venous return to the heart and thus it reduces the preload at a higher dose it can also reduce the afterload by causing some vasodilatation in the peripheral uh, vascular system one of the best things about nitroglycerin is it dilates large coronary vessels which is why it relieves chest pain in patients with uh, significant angina pectoris. Nitroglycerin is also shown to improve coronary collateral circulation in patients with ischemic uh, heart disease. Nitroglycerin also antagonizes vasospasms. Nitroglycerin could also relieve esophageal spasm which may be sometimes confusing because we don't know if the chest pain was related to the coronary artery disease or whether it was related to esophageal spasm. Nitroglycerin uh, is most commonly given uh, as a sublingual 0.4 milligram tablet which will be dissolved under the tongue and then it can be repeated every five minutes to a maximum of three doses. If those three doses don't work, then it's better to call 911 or head to the emergency room. Nitroglycerin is given as an IV bolus of 12.5 to 25 micrograms, uh, then titrated according to the symptoms and blood pressure. The side effects of nitroglycerin would include hypotension and tachycardia. Morphine. Morphine is also a very common drug used in cardiovascular patients, especially those coming with chest pain or myocardial infarction. Morphine reduces myocardial oxygen requirement. It reduces venous return. It also reduces pain and systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary congestion. The indications, of course, are uh, patients with chest pain, uh, acute coronary syndrome, or patients with acute myocardial infarction. The dose of morphine is 1 to 4 milligrams IV over 1 to 5 minutes, and this can be repeated every 5 to 10 minutes, depending on the duration of the symptoms. One of the side effects of uh, morphine is uh, respiratory depression uh, that can be troublesome and needs to be looked into. Morphine also by reducing venous return can in fact reduce uh, blood pressure especially in patients with uh, history of significant heart failure. Norcan. Norcan is a drug that is used to reverse the opioid sedation effect. It is administered as an IV dose which ranges from 0.4 to 2 milligrams IV and this can be repeated every two to three minutes but uh, an important thing to keep in mind is that the opioid overdose lasts for a much longer time while the effect of Norcan lasts for a short duration of time and hence these patients may slip into uh, their uh, sedative state once the effect of uh, Norcan wears off. Now let's look at some special situations such as out of the hospital, uh, like at a residential site, and what are the things that we can do in the ambulance, and what are the things that we can do in a, in a hospital setup. If, if you are the emergency medical team and you are answering a call, uh, what are the things that you can possibly do at the victim's residence? 
You can administer aspirin. You can start the patient on oxygen. You can start an intravenous line. You also can perhaps give nitroglycerin and also morphine. But please note that only paramedics are certified for giving medications. So let's look at some of the medications that we can give through the endotracheal tube. There are circumstances, especially in the field, where you're not able to get an IV access or in a small setup, hospital setup, where you have limited number of qualified people to assist you. In those circumstances, if you're able to get an endotracheal tube, then some of these medications can be given through the endotracheal tube, namely lidocaine, epinephrine, atropine, and Norcan. However, the dose has to be almost double or two and a half times that of the normal dose that we use intravenously. And hopefully that medication can get into their system and take uh, their appropriate effects. Now let's look at a different class of drugs that are used in cardiac patients who may not be in a state of cardiac arrest or cardiogenic shock. They may have come to the emergency room with a chest pain where they may be having uh, angina, acute coronary syndrome, or perhaps a mild or a moderate heart attack. Some of the drugs that we have used in the past is or heparin. We have used heparin in the past for cardiac patients for many years. Uh, the mechanism of action of heparin is uh, it is an indirect thrombin inhibitor. Heparin has been mostly used in patients with the coronary artery bypass surgery uh, when the patients are placed on a heart lung machine. PCI is not routinely done using heparin uh, nowadays. And of course, heparin is also useful in patients with uh, deep venous thrombosis in the legs or, or a major pulmonary embolus uh, that may be precipitating this, uh, these cardiovascular events which we have been talking about. And heparin is also useful in patients with large myocardial infarctions, atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation and presence of left necrotic thrombus due to low cardiac output or scarring of the left ventricle. Heparin is given as a bolus 60 units per kg up to a maximum of 4000 units. And this heparin drip can be continued at a 12 micrograms per kg per hour, a maximum of 1,000 units per hour for patients less than 70 kg. And of course, uh, we routinely monitor the partial thromboplastin time and adjust the heparin dosage to keep that partial thromboplastin time between 1.5 to 2 times that of the control value for at least 48 hours. The target range of uh, Activated partial thromboplastin time is roughly between 50 and 70 seconds and it can be measured at 6, 12, 18 and 24 hours so that we can adjust the heparin dose. Of course, heparin is contraindicated in patients with active bleeding or a history of a recent intracranial hemorrhage or patients who are going for uh, major surgery. The next class of drugs that are used in patients with uh, cardiovascular problems are fibrinolytic drugs. These are the drugs which break down the, the fibrin network that is uh, formed during the formation of a clot. Or if you have a patient with an acute myocardial infarction who has a 95% underlying plaque uh, on top of which there is a clot sitting there which is causing a 100% blockage leading to a heart attack and this fibrin rich clot needs to be broken down so that it can restore the blood circulation. As a result, these fibrinolytic agents are used in patients with acute myocardial infarction do work in restoring circulation in majority of the patients. But more and more patients are going to the cardiac catheterization lab directly from the emergency room uh, nowadays, as a result, uh, the use of uh, fibrinolytic agents in the presence of an acute myocardial infarction uh, have become less and less uh, with the time. Nonetheless, the, the drugs that are available are uh, autoplase, retoplase, and streptokinase. 
A different class of drug which we also use is the integralin. Integralin is also used in patients with acute coronary syndrome and also patients undergoing coronary uh, interventions. During acute coronary syndrome, uh, integralin is given as uh, 180 milligrams per kg bolus and that is followed by 2 micrograms per kg per minute continuous infusion for 12 to 18 hours following acute coronary intervention. And let's look at some special conditions where some of these drugs are going to be most appropriate. So, so the conditions that we're going to look at are acute coronary syndrome and acute stroke. Of course, patients with acute coronary syndrome have EKG changes, chest pain, and probably reduces circulation to a given region of the heart muscle. These patients need to be stabilized. Uh, we need to control their pain and admit them to the uh, intensive care unit to monitor their vital signs more closely. And we also use the fibrinolytic agents to improve the circulation through the heart muscle if possible before these patients are taken for coronary intervention if that is indicated. Patient with an acute stroke, uh, one more important thing that we use is uh, TPA is uh, a tissue plasminogen activator. It is used in stroke and it should be administered within three hours of the onset of uh, symptoms. These patients also receive fluids, beta blockers, and since majority of these patients come with significantly elevated blood pressure, they may be treated with nipride or nicardipine to bring down the blood pressure. So some of the critical points that we need to take into consideration when we are dealing in a cardiac arrest situation or a cardiac collapse happening from acute myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolus, massive bleeding, massive stroke, uh, high fevers, things like that, uh, we, we need to make sure that the time is of the essence. Time is life. That's all I can tell you. Time is to be used most prudently from the time we arrive there while we are addressing a patient who needs cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So any interruption during the cardiac resuscitation should be no more than five to six seconds. We need to have a very broad knowledge of the, the drugs, the indications, the contraindications, their side effects, and the frequency with which we need to be using these drugs. Have a general knowledge of all the drugs that are available in your institution, especially in your CP or CART, so that you can quickly access them when needed. Learn when you need to repeat certain drugs and how many times you can repeat the drugs. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is a comprehensive review of ACLS Drugs 2016. I hope this has been useful to you. We also have an ACLS EKG Interpretations and Management 2016 on uh, this YouTube channel. Please do watch that video, which will help you to get a better understanding of EKG interpretation and management uh, in patients with uh, cardiopulmonary emergencies. Again, I am Dr. Nick Nickham. Thank you for watching this presentation. Uh, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please watch the video I have on ACLS 2016 EKG Interpretations and Management. Thank you so much and please, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you next time. I am Dr. Nick Nickham.